Um, so we're just coming up to the 50th anniversary of the landing of Surveyor 1, uh, NASA's, America's first soft landing on the moon, June the 2nd. Um, it's very memorable for me because it was the first space mission uh, of significance that I was associated with. I started at Tidbin Builder in uh, February 1966 after having worked five years at Laverton on aircraft flight testing. Turned up in Canberra on, the, on decimal currency day, 14th of February 1966, and Surveyor 1 was my first mission. Uh, the, 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 uh, the picture which I happen to have now but uh, is of the Surveyor spacecraft. It's a three-legged device with two omni antennas, a high-gain antenna, a solar panel, television camera, built by Hughes, Hughes Aircraft in Los Angeles. Uh, it took quite a few years to get itself to the to that stage. There were quite a few misstarts and a, and a few failures. Um, but anyway, Surveyor One uh, launched at the end of uh, May, uh, nineteen sixty six. It, it looks like it's on the beach there, Mike. Did it uh, it does. Missed landing <laughs> or what? <laughs> I think I think this particular photograph was probably taken at White Sands, they'd, New Mexico. They did a number of drop tests. Uh, to check out the landing radar and the retro engine and the verniers, um, obviously doing it in 1G gravity. Uh, so that had been checked out to the extent you can in a 1G environment. So uh, the role of uh, the tracking station here in Camera was at what's called Tidbin Billa, the Tidbin Billa Deep Space Station. Uh, also known as the Deep Space Instrumentation Facility in those days. Uh, we were one of the uh, three stations around the world that tracked um, Surveyor. The other Deep Space Station in Australia at that time was at Woomera, or near Woomera, Deep Space Station 41. It, however, was working with Lunar Orbiter, which was in many ways equally important to Surveyor. That was taking detailed in-orbit uh, pictures for the mission. Um, there was a precursor to 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 uh, to this uh, uh, soft landing, and that was Ranger, Ranger, which was a lunar impact mission. Again, this was one of the first that JPL, uh, the Americans, NASA, um, ran. It, although, and it started in about 1961, they had many failures. In fact, the very first attempt didn't even hit the moon at all. It missed it entirely. But eventually they had some very good results from Surveyor 1 ending up with pictures that were down to about a 20 centimeter resolution and uh, in the end, as they after an awful lot of problems, uh, everybody was reasonably happy with that. Um, the Ranger spacecraft uh, was had solar panels only, it didn't have any other power source. Um, and uh, but it it worked quite well, and it it used what was called the L band tracking system in those days. And and that just orbited the moon, yeah. No, it 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 was a hard. It just hit it. Oh, it bang, yeah. oh, crashed. Okay. Uh, the lunar orbiter, um, which came later and it came in along in parallel with Surveyor, uh, did the orbiting. Um, Although the Americans were the uh, surveyor was the first American mission to land, they'd been beaten by the Russians, which I'm sure was to the chagrin of a great deal of my colleagues uh, in NASA. Uh, Luna 9 landed in January 66, and it operated for about seven hours, and it did show some pictures of the uh, of the lunar surface. So certainly the Russians were first, although the uh, surveyor certainly became a a far longer term uh, mission and I'm not aware of any other Russian landings other than that Lunar 9. There might have been but uh, I'm not aware of them. So moving on to what the objectives of Surveyor was, it, it had three primary objectives. They had hoped to do a lot of science on the spacecraft but it came down basically to an engineering and a, de a demonstration mission. Uh, demonstrate that the Atlas Centaur rocket combination uh, could work okay, and that was going to be quite an achievement because there hadn't really been a successful uh, all up Centaur launch, certainly not a reignite of the Centaur in uh, Earth orbit. And the other, the next major objective was to 
show that they could do mid-course and terminal maneuvers and actually land on the moon. And the third uh, priority was uh, to show that the deep space network could provide satisfactory communications uh, with the spacecraft. But note in particular, there is not a fourth, there is no primary objective to take photographs or take images of the moon. Yeah. So <laughs> that was looked on as a, well, maybe we might. Uh, no one expected it to be successful because it had all these problems, hence they kept it to these three primary objectives. So, Surveyor was launched on this Atlas Centaur uh, combination um, in, uh, in the end of May, 66, uh, from the Cape. Uh, the structure of the rocket was, uh, uh, as a, I have a picture that shows the, the Centaur being the second stage. Uh, the Centaur was of great interest in that it was liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Uh, fuel, which is pretty fiendish to, to think about, mm. put into a, a, a tank and sh throwing up into orbit, and it took a long while to become reliable. However, however, it became a workhorse of the NASA launch system and is still in use today in a derivative. So, although it started off with a lot of problems, it, it came out as a very productive uh, rocket. So that centre was used to get into Earth orbit and then reignited to get the spacecraft to the moon? Well, yes and no. That was the intent. That was the original intent. A little bit like uh, Apollo, where you go into lunar orbit and then you do a second burn to go on trajectory. Because Atlas Centaur 8, AC-8, was meant to demonstrate that but failed, they decided to have a direct launch or a direct trajectory without a parking orbit. Mm -hmm. So... There is a, a a picture for those who can see the pictures of the of the trajectory from the Earth to the Moon, uh, which involved that direct launch, um, and then the spacecraft acquired got its orientation by pointing at the Sun on one axis and uh, Canopus Star on the other axis. They did a thing called a mid-course correction to uh, ensure it hit the Moon and arrived at the desired target. And it took about 60 odd hours to get to the uh, to the moon. And when it got to within 60 miles of the moon, then it initiated its uh, its landing landing sequence. Um, so this, well, I, so the landing sequence involved the uh, ignition of a retro rocket, uh, and the space was stabilized by three what they call vernier engines. Um, now, I have a two-minute uh, clip here, a video clip of, of the actual landing and the audio, and uh, I'm, I'll, we'll try playing that now and uh, hope it all works out. I'm just, I've got to put my microphone in front of the speakers here to make this happen, but here I am, I'm starting the movie. So the video is on the, on the wall behind you there, Mike. You yeah. Share that on the screen. Here it is. Okay. There it is. Oh, yes, okay. And that should be full screen. And... Got to turn the sound on, so... Okay, so you can see a bunch of people in a control room. Pull it. And it's fine. <laughs> Ten seconds, waiting for the marking radar. Four, three, two, one, mark. We should now get verification of the marking signal. And what you are hearing is the actual sound of the telemetry from the rocket, from the spacecraft. The main rocket has exploded. Retro is now firing. Retro rocket is firing in a critical way. And the sudden burst of applause here in the auditorium at the Jet Pulse. We are now at 5,148 miles an hour. Down to 116,000 feet, 4590. 30 seconds of now flight. down to 63,000 feet, 3,900 miles per hour. AT's acceleration. We are now at 30,000 feet. Retro burnout is confirmed. 
just on the nose. Thirty-two thousand feet. Almost exactly on the predicted. Four hundred feet per second vertical velocity. Twenty-eight thousand feet. Four twenty-five feet per second. Four twenty-five feet per second. Twenty-four thousand feet. Engineering commutator three has been turned on. We are in lock with the engineering three data. Strain gauges are reading out. These strain gauges will give us indication about touchdown. 400 feet per second. 12,000 feet. 12, feet. Well within the parameters. 10,000 feet. All signals are normal. 8,000 feet. 250 feet per second. 8,000 feet. 200 feet per second. An extraordinary moment, but maybe in the making here one of the most surprising and dramatic Service successes of the United States. Station. Station. All signals look good. 4,000 feet, stable. 4,000 feet, stable. And stable. That was a key word. Unknown was the effect of the possibly not extended. One thousand foot mark. Thousand foot mark. Eight hundred feet. Thirty-eight seconds to go. Four hundred feet. Two hundred feet. One feet One hundred feet. Second speed. Perfect. Uh, absolutely. Uh, All now depends on the stability, attitude stability of the surveyor one. We're looking here at a picture, actually, it's of Surveyor 3, but it's identical to Surveyor 1, except that Surveyor 3 had a surface sampler scoop digger on it. Um, you can see all the components of the, of the spacecraft. Uh, it's two omnis, it's high-gain antenna, and it's solar ray, and the camera, and it's three landing pads. Uh, and then shortly after landing, uh, we started taking pictures. Uh, and here, for those who got the picture, uh, we we got a number of Polaroids. All the pictures came down slow, relatively slow scan. They were recorded on 70-millimeter uh, film. They were also recorded on uh, magnetic tape. And, and for quick-look purposes, we had Polaroids uh, pictures. And here's one or two of them now. Um, we had three, three tracking stations, as I said, the camera one, uh, Madrid and, and also Johannesburg, South Africa were involved, and, and Goldstone. Once you're outside about 10,000 or 13,000 kilometers, uh, those stations can see deep space, including the moon, continuously. Uh, so th we had this network of uh, Goldstone Lake in California, Tidbinbilla, and Johannesburg with Madrid. As I said earlier, the Woomera station uh, was busy tracking lunar orbiter and dedicated lunar orbiter well, this is the map of the world as it was as regards tracking stations in the in the 60s era uh, four five locations California the Goldstone Lake which is in the Mojave Desert uh, Madrid Spain and Johannesburg in the, in South Africa and in Australia we had the Woomera a station near uh, near Woomera called Deep Space Station 41 and the one I was involved with, and the one that supported Surveyor, was Tidbinbilla, near Canberra. And if and when you're in Canberra, uh, Tidbinbilla is still very accessible. It has a great uh, uh, visitor centre, including the, uh, a piece of an Apollo 11 uh, moon rock, which is the biggest piece of Apollo 11 rock outside North America. And we had two other stations in the ACT at that time, the Apollo Man Flight Station, uh, Honeysuckle Creek, and the Aurodal Valley uh, foot tracking uh, the near Earth spacecraft. Um, the 
Deep Space Station 42 at Tibimbilla is just the other side of the Murrumbidgee, shielded from the any radio interference problems by the uh, a ridge running along the Murrumbidgee. It comprised one single 85-foot or 26-metre diameter antenna, uh, our angle declination equatorial mount, uh, an operations building and a canteen and a, and a powerhouse. Um, it had all the facilities of that era. Uh, the equipment generally comprised transmitting, receiving, um, and navigation equipment. Navigation being measuring the speed of the spacecraft to a high accuracy and the range, the distance. Uh, the, this latter relied on a very accurate timing system, which was the, the best in the Southern Hemisphere at that time. And if anybody ever is interested in talking the nuts and bolts and detail of, this, of that type of equipment, I can do that some other time. Uh, how's it going, Peter? Perfect. So, okay. so Mike, uh, for people that are not aware, this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, Parks the Dish, is it? This is a different facility we're looking at? Yeah, this is quite different. Uh, the Parks Antenna, the Parks Dish, is a radio astronomy facility, Australian-owned, CSIRO-owned. But there are some commonalities. The concept of a, of a dish providing a, a narrow beam to receive radio waves is, is, similar, is the same between uh, these facilities. Uh, but, of course, a, a space tracking station, one of its biggest characteristics is being able to radiate, transmit, and so that's a big difference. Uh, Parks does not has no need, of course, for a, a transmission capability. But there are similarities, and and there's been cross fertilisation over the years. I'll just give you a little anecdote. The uh, the Parks dish incorporates what's called a, a mass equatorial, which is a a way of pointing the antenna very accurately. Uh, that was designed by Barnes Wallace of uh, Bouncing Bomb. Dan Buster's fame, uh, he, he, the, the proposal he put up didn't win, but his concept of what's called the Master Equatorial was adopted uh, by Metrovic in building the parts antenna. And then that, in turn, was picked up and used by JPL uh, for building their big antennas. So up wow. in the center of the, uh, of the Deep Space Network's big dishes is what's called a, a Master Equatorial System traceable directly back to Barnes Wallace. So, pressing right along, this equipment was all analog. You know, there's lots of switches, knobs, meters, uh, people having to do the right thing at the right time. And depending on how well they did that, directly affected the, uh, the quality of the signal. Uh, very labor-intensive, but uh, needless to say, very satisfying for all, all people involved. You, you didn't just sit in front of a computer screen, as we all tend to do now. So we had, oh, I don't know, 10 to 16 people in, on, the, on the shift. But then in addition to the uh, tracking station, people, we had a whole gang, and I put that in quotes, of Hughes, Hughes aircraft, Hughes surveyor people. And uh, there was about eight or ten of them, um, some of whom are, are still around, I might say. In fact, one or two of those, just by the by, uh, when they finished the, the surveyor mission, came to work with us at Honeysuckle Creek during Apollo so a lot of people involved, very labor intensive. And the Hughes equipment in particular had a, a three position uh, seated thing. Uh, on the left hand side is a telemetry where uh, there are meters and lights to show the data coming down. In the middle of the command console for sending commands up. And the right hand most is the video uh, control. Uh, effectively, the, the, we had a complete uh, spacecraft control center at the station, uh, although normally they did, did only and precisely what we're told to from the central control in, in Pasadena. That, that, uh, la that last image there, Mike, it looked like yep. there was a, like a Polaroid camera attached to a, a There screen. is, is there right? is. In fact, that is correct. The, this oh, Polaroid wow. camera is the one of, from which those uh, earlier Polaroid pictures I showed you. Uh, the, this was for quick look, mind you. Uh, the more precise ones are on, on 70 millimeter of film. And only yesterday, for the first time, did I find out that someone is now rescanning all those old 70 millimeter films. And uh, if anybody's interested enough, if you go a Googling for uh, Surveyor uh, 70 millimeter 
um, scanning, you'll see there's two or three groups uh, right now. And I didn't even know this until yesterday. Um, so anyway, pressing along, uh, here's a good quote from John Flaxman, who was one of our people. In addition to the Hughes people, we had uh, Tibby and Miller people working with them. As he says, the great thing was the spacecraft was manually controlled, uh, where the stations nowadays act more like relays, just passing on data. It was different then. You sat at a console, pushed buttons move, to move the camera, change the focus, dig a hole, and it was real hands-on stuff. And you could see the results straight away on the telemetry or the television. Wow. Very technically, very satisfying. That would be uh, amazing. It was great. Um, a few more anecdotes. As I said, the, the, w no one expected the thing to land. No one expected it to work. No one expected it to take 10,000 pictures. So we had to buy up all the Polaroid film in Canberra and Queanbeyan. <laughs> uh, we had people scouting everywhere to buy film. Uh, the Maser failed, the Maser being the low noise amplifier that runs at liquid helium temperatures, but we had such good communication margins, it really didn't matter. We could use a backup uh, amplifier without really any problem. As I said, no one expected it to be successful. There'd been no Atlas Centaur successes. Um, the size of the Hughes team irritated my boss, Bob Leslie, who was station director, and I remember very clearly at 3 a.m. one morning having to explain to the Hughes people that it wasn't personnel, but uh, Bob had the right idea that we Australians were quite capable of operating that equipment. Anyway, eventually that's what happened, but it took a while. Um, uh, oh, one interesting thing, we had, well, we never had actually two surveyors on the moon transmitting at the same time, but, we, but it looked like we're going to at one point. We're, we're going to have Surveyor 1 and Surveyor 2 there at the same time on the same frequency. And so we, we trained up and simulated those two identical signals. And by locking up one and pulling one signal to one side using the phase lock loop and pulling the other one to the other side, and uh, that we showed that that could be done and it worked. And, uh, and we had to use exactly this technique when we had Apollo 13 Oh. And we had the lunar module and the instrument unit in the Saturn 4B transmitting to us on the ex on the same frequency. And I, I'd given this a little bit of thought before Apollo 13, knew this could be done, and that's what we used uh, to separate out those two Apollo 13 signals. And that was an Australian initiative, or, or uh, yes, I, I guess it was. It, wow. Yes, it was us working with the with the the Hughes uh, Tibbin Miller team. But yes, it was uh, it was an Australian initiative, and it was picked up by Goddard, the, the Goddard Space Flight Centre, the people responsible for the manned uh, the space network. Uh, Bob, my boss, said planned to go on leave after three days. No one expected the thing to survive, but it did. Need to cancel his leave. Further, no one expected the battery to survive a lunar night, but it did, uh, and more. And uh, it last, I think the last time there was a signal from Surveyor 1 was about six months later, uh, wow. just the beginning of 67. So it was quite <laughs> astounding. Um, uh, yeah, the, one of the ops supervisors, Paddy Johnson, and I, when, <laughs> when Surveyor 1 landed on the moon, we went out to try and decide where the hell it was on the moon, but by, by the time you've got latitude and longitude uh, in your mind, where the Terminator is and whether the moon's up and the moon's upside down, sort <laughs> of, in the southern hemisphere, we gave up. It was just too confusing. Yeah, One important first on Surveyor was ranging. Uh, a fellow called Pete Lindley in JPL had designed a PRN, pseudo-random noise ranging system, that had not been used before. Uh, anyway, it worked, and it worked well on Surveyor. It was, by the way, then used on Apollo. But, but, more, but more topically, the, the PRN ranging idea that, that was pioneered here has gone on to become uh, the basis for the GPS, the modern GPS system. Wow. So that, that's a direct spin-off from, uh, from JPL, from Surveyor, and from the ranging system. It's amazing the number of things that have come out of the space program in all its, phase, all its facets. Exactly. I mean, things a that have never envisaged. 
A very, yeah, a very important one is a phase lock loop. Now, only those people who are sort of into electronics will will get the important significance of that. But phase lock loops are used everywhere in electronics now. They were pioneered as part of the deep space tracking system. It allowed you to measure Doppler shift on the radio signal down to absolutely fractions and fractions of a of a cycle. Um, when I arrived at Tibbinbilla, I was horrified to see at least with 12 feet worth of surveyor documentation. The amount of paper was unbelievable, but uh, it turned out I only needed to know a few bits of it. That, uh, most of it we got by without. Um, all the Hughes racks of equipment, uh, and there were many, many, were painted the famous Hughes light green. It's said that Howard Hughes bought millions of gallons of surplus green paint post-war <laughs> And all every Hughes building uh, in El Segundo in uh, in uh, Los Angeles was also painted this light green, oh, wow. so you could always pick anything that was built by Hughes at, at a distance. <laughs> uh, there were some, of course, needless to say, Surveyor really was there for leading to Apollo, um, and and it, plainly it showed that there was a solid surface. It showed that the dust didn't uh, didn't blow up in a, in an unbelie in a horrible way, and from my and our point of view, the tracking and communication systems, so-called S band, uh, that's the two gigahertz frequency band, uh, worked beautifully, and uh, the complementary trajectory computation and control, this communication equipment was completely replicated in Apollo. Um, so this was a great lead-in to demonstrate that the Apollo system could and would work. And from my own personal point of view, it was a, a marvelous period. I spent about a year working with Surveyor, and then when I moved over to the Honeysuckle Creek Station, um, a large part of most of the equipment there, certainly the front transmitter receiver uh, navigation, was identical to what I've been familiar with in uh, in the in the deep space station. So that was an important. One for me personally, as well as the the, the Apollo program. Sure. I've got a few links, and uh, we can give access to these. Uh, uh, quite a lot. It's like everything else. I'd, I'd particularly uh, recommend Carl McKellar's Surveyor section. Carl is this keen, very keen Sydney space character who has done a magnificent job in the last oh, 15 years now in putting up anything and everything to do with Australia and uh, and tracking. And that little uh, snippet we had of the landing was from a live CBS coverage. Um, well worth watching. It's about 40 minutes worth of it, but the actual landing part was about two minutes. Okay. Well, we'll put the links uh, in the YouTube uh, page and our website. Uh, for okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I've that's it, more or less. Uh, uh, thanks to Cole, Cole McKellar. He's supplied a lot, a lot of equipment. Curry Doherty, who used to run the uh, uh, the powerhouse space section, uh, helped me quite a bit. Bruce, Bruce Windows, one of my ops uh, uh, leaders in in that era. And the last two, John Flax and Les Whaley, worked in the uh, in the Surveyor uh, area. So that that was Surveyor One. Fantastic. And and so the actual mission took place for, uh, May. May. Uh, late May, I can't uh, launch. May, May thirty. Right, that's year, yeah, that's right. And the touchdown was moon. was June the second. It 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 landed about four p four p.m. ish our time, uh, but we didn't rise till about six p.m. It the, the 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 landing was intentionally slated and and organised to happen within the Goldstone, California view, because they had a a good microwave link from. Uh, from the desert uh, into Pasadena, whereas we, by the way, we ran the whole mission on one 1,200 bits per second data circuit, not bytes, not megabytes, not gigabytes, bits, 1,200 bits per second. And so most of the analysis and, and display and command actually happened at the station. Wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. And Mike, yourself, you've got a very interesting post-surveyor career. Um, like yes, I, uh, I, I, well, one important part, which is, yes, I, I moved from, from Tibbet Miller to Honeysuckle, doing a similar role of running the operation at Honeysuckle, 
And I was there for Apollo 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, running the operations, which was very satisfying. 11 in particular, of course, where we supplied the first picture to the world. Um, then I moved back to Tidbin Biller, and in 1972, I had a year at JPL uh, responsible for the system design of the big new antenna, the DSS-43, the 64-meter antenna, which is now 70 meters. And during that year, um, while it was building, um, I, I decided that it would be finished in sufficient time for Apollo 17, just. And my boss, uh, Tom Reed, back at Tidbin Biller, agreed with me. So although there was a little bit of not too happiness from JPL, they, they, we decided it would support, and it did support. And that gave me a fantastic excuse to get to uh, Houston for Apollo 17. And if, if you can you see the screen at the moment? Uh, I've got that, yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I sat in uh, for the launch there. And I sat by Network's elbow uh, for, for most of a day. And I sat with Ed Fendell, the um, uh, INCO con telecom controller, who I'd got to know quite well. And uh, the second highlight of my career was uh, to sit on Ed Fendell's console and send some commands to oh, wow. swap, swap the antennas on, uh, on Apollo 17. And I stayed there through lunar orbit insertion. When it came from behind the moon, Goldstone were tracking, and I, it took me about three milliseconds to decide the acquired on a side lobe of the antenna and a side band. Um, and I was sitting by the side of network controller at that time in the Houston room there, and I said, hey, they've got a side lobe and a side band. And they said, they said, well, no, they say they haven't. I said, they bloody well have. Anyway, it did eventually turn out to be that. I mean, easily done. Um, sure. So that was a, uh, so, a pot, whoops, I'll go the other way. Uh, I wrote the support plan for uh, DSS-43 to support Apollo 17. It's on, it's on my website and Cole's website. That's a, we have a block diagram uh, of how 43, DSS-43 supported Apollo. It was more or less similar to Parks. The signal was received at Tibimbilla, uh, but then shipped to Honeysuckle for decommutation, demodulation, and the like. And... Uh, Oh, these are, and I've still got several documents. Oh, here's a good cartoon. For those who can't actually read it, it, it shows uh, some little moon men looking at Apollo 17 orbiting the moon and saying, well, then it's agreed. We observe them one more time. <laughs> if they're okay, we'll greet the next bunch. <laughs> so, that, so there you go. That was, oh, uh, we've got Apollo 7 mission events in great detail uh, and a couple more documents. So... All the best that when you've all go and see uh, Gene Cernan and Apollo 17. Yes. By the way, this picture of Apollo 17, the moon rover, just by the by, was a complete spacecraft in its own right, which we had to cope with in addition to the lunar module. So there you go, Peter. That's me. That's fantastic, Mike. Uh, we had a bit of com issue just creeping in the last few minutes, but it's back, back now again nicely. I really appreciate you taking the time and... Um, and for your patience last night at the meeting. Oh, and um, thank you for joining us on the Space Show and the Space Association. And uh, we look forward to speaking with you again soon, perhaps on some further uh, anniversaries and things. Maybe, if my memory still st <laughs> <laughs> looks pretty still strong to me. 50 years on, the, the, although I can sound authoritative, uh, I'm sure there's a lot I've forgotten. Terrific. Well, thank you, Mikey. Okay. Have a great afternoon. And All right. Thank you again. Bye. All you. the best. Bye -bye. See you later. Bye.